I think there is a real shortage of consideration of the end of a matter in our culture and the things that are going on around us. We've been trained to consider the present, right? We, people talk about living in the now, you know, living presently. And, 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 and that's somewhat important, but we've kind of lost the art of considering the end of things. As we're coming to here now in the book of Revelation here in chapter 19, we're at the end. We're at the end of the end. Not just the end of the book, but we're reading about, we're, we're studying the end of the world as we know it. And it is both glorious and horrific. Like specifically this latter part of Revelation 19, it contains glory uh, for the children of God. It's, it's, it's glorious for us. But then there's also a sense that it's horrific. It's horrific for God's enemies. And so that's what we're going to be taking in today. The, the, the end of things and, and the, the glory for the children of God and the horror for those who are not his. So let's read our text. Revelation 19, we're picking up in verse 11. John's continuing uh, to tell us about this vision. He says, and I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat of the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Verse 20, and the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in the presence, in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Wow. The first part of this is perhaps one of the most magnificent scenes in all of prophecy. We're talking about, we're seeing the, this vision of the return of Jesus. And he's different. He's different in the way that he's presented, in the way that John describes him, in the way that he's seen in this vision. He's no longer the suffering servant. He's still, he, he's still Jesus, but he's, he's not coming in the sense, in the same way that he came originally as the suffering servant. He's now the conquering king. And every detail, as John describes this thing, every detail of this vision highlights that very idea. He is the conquering king. He says, heaven is opened. He's coming from heaven. And it would seem as though this is all really you need to, to know. He's coming from heaven. He's coming from the throne room of God. This speaks to his identity. It's interesting that 
Uh, here, he's pictured as coming from heaven. Heavens are open. Here comes the king. It's an interesting contrast to the derogatory things that were said in his earthly life. And his association, even with the, the place of his origin. Born in Bethlehem, but then raised in Nazareth. And you know that they, they used that as a derogatory thing in his life. Nathaniel famously said in first, or John chapter 1, verse 46, Nathaniel said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I think they're just make, making fun of him. He's from this podunk town, Nowheresville. Philip said, come and see. In his, in his, orig- his incarnation, that is in his first coming, Jesus was identified with man. Though he's no, he's still God. He, but he identified with mankind. Born in humble circumstances, born as a man, raised um, amongst men, he identified with man. Here now, his identification is with God. It comes from heaven, and all of these things add to that. Every one of these details adds to that very thing. Here's Jesus. He's God. He's seated on a white horse. Now there's another white horse referenced in chapter 6. We saw a white horse whose rider, it says, went out to conquer. This was a picture of a false Christ who was from the earth. He came to to conquer. He He was conquering. This is the true Christ from heaven. The earlier one was really a mockery. The color of the white horse here suggests royalty. As one commentator put it, the power of the elite. Since since white horses were considered to be the best and so often selected for rulers, for kings. It's symbolic. He's seated on a white horse. He's royalty. He's called faithful and true. Again, each one of these, each one of these things is worthy of an independent study all on its own. But here, just this, this, these titles, this, this characteristic that he's known by faithful and true. These are some of the greatest characteristics of him. He's faithful. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with uh, what you have. For he himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Now, there's, a, there's a, an Old Testament line there at the end of that that's a promise. It's a promise that you and I hold on to, isn't it? I will never desert you. I will never forsake you. What an incredible promise that that is. And and people for ages have held on to that. Our God does not desert us. Our God does not forsake us. Our Savior is faithful. And I'll tell you, we live in a world of unfaithful people. Right? Oftentimes we ourselves even are not always entirely faithful, but our God is faithful. Jesus Christ is faithful. He was faithful in his rescue mission. He was faithful even unto death. And he remains faithful today. Amen. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, it says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. What an incredible truth that is. What an incredible promise that is. And it's in the face of our own unfaithfulness at times. Are you completely 100% faithful all the time to God? No. He is. And even when you're not faithful, he's always faithful. It's amazing. It's awesome. And it says he cannot deny himself. It's who he is. He can't be otherwise. This is who he is. He is faithful. He is true. And this, again, this speaks to us in the condition and in in the culture that surrounds us today when it seems like we can't even find truth. I mean, the whole world has gone crazy 
in the denial of obvious truth. Here is our Savior who declared himself to be truth. John 14, 6, he says, I am the truth. And, and it's not just that he speaks true words. I mean, we all can speak true words. He not only speaks true words, he's the embodiment of all truth. He's the key to truth. Again, John's just seeing these things. He's just recording these things. The purpose for it is that the church would know these things, that the church would remember these things. We would recognize this is our king. The third thing here, there's a list of 10 that we're going through. It says that his eyes are a flame of fire. Eyes are so interesting because eyes can communicate so much. I'm looking around and I, I, I look at people's eyes. I'm look, you can tell if somebody's paying attention. One of the things that I've really enjoyed about the dog that we have, I know this might sound kind of weird, but I've fallen in love with our golden retriever. And she's just so cute. And one of the things that she does is, is, is like almost every morning, it seems like, she just begins just kind of looking at me. Like I'm reading and doing a little devotional and stuff, and she's just staring at me. And then I'll invite her to come jump on my lap. And she just comes and lays on my lap, just like this, and stares at my face. And, and she's looking at me in the eyes. And we have this connection. And it's weird and wonderful. We just stare at each other. And I, I just love it. And, and there's just something that's so sweet and, and soothing about it. I have no idea what she's thinking. Like, are we going to have steak again? I really like that. I, I don't know what she's thinking. But it just feels like she loves me. Dogs are so much different than cats. Dogs look you in the eye. I don't think when we take this in, the idea that Jesus has these eyes that are like a flame of fire, I don't think that we should imagine that when we see him, he's going to have these flames shooting out of his eyes. I think this is, this is metaphoric language. It's, it's part of John's vision. It's what he sees, but it's, it's a picture that's intended to describe something of his character, something of his nature that's important for us to understand. And here's what it is. It's that his eyes are searching. His eyes are knowing. They're, they're, they're on some level, they're consuming. And it's this idea that nothing escapes his sight. He searches all things. Nothing. Nothing is hidden from him. Nothing can be hidden from him. In Hebrews 4, 13, it says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And that last part is really important. Uh, of him with whom we have to do. Because at the end of the day, he's the Lord. And at the end of the day, he's the one with whom we have to do. And here's what the writer is communicating. He sees it all. And isn't it interesting how we spend a lot of our lives hiding? I mean, from the fall, what's the first thing that Adam did? He hid. Right? Hey, let's, let's, let's hide from God. Let's try to cover this thing ourselves. And let's try to escape his sight. We, we don't want to see him. And ever since then, this is what we do. This is what our sin nature does. We suppose that somehow, if we don't bring our sin to him, if we don't acknowledge it, somehow we kind of just run this little fantasy in our brain that somehow he's not really paying attention or that he doesn't care. No, nothing is hidden from his sight. Everything is laid open. Everything is laid bare. In the sense, it's that idea of we stand naked before him. He sees everything. We need to be reminded of these things. This is not just some information about future events. 
It is that, but these are the qualities of Christ as John sees them, and, and they are real qualities. Jesus sees you. Like that, that, that ought to minister to us. His eyes see you. Again, I think sometimes, you know, we can talk ourselves into thinking, hey, he's not really paying attention to me. No, he sees you too. He sees you, friend. He sees your heartache. He knows what you're going through. How comforting that is. He sees your struggle. He sees your sin. Likewise, he sees the good things that you do. Jesus talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. He talked about in, in Matthew 6, he, he, he talks about over and over again how God sees the things that we do in secret. He mentions the fact that, that when people give in Matthew 6, 4, he says he sees that. He says when people pray, Matthew 6, 6, he says he sees that. He says when, when you fast, 6, 18, God sees that too. So he sees the, he sees the things that you do that are, that are good in love and response to him. Like that's comforting to know because sometimes it seems like other people, no one really needs to see it anyway, but he sees it. And that's the point. He sees what's done in secret. He sees your evil deeds as well. He sees your evil thoughts. We have each one of us, you know, you've got the, the screen of your mind, the things that, you know, it's like entertainment. You've got your own screen and you think things and you see things. And sometimes you give way more attention to those things, the thoughts and the imaginations and the wickedness of the heart. He sees that too. Oh my goodness. The scripture is filled with examples of God demonstrating that he sees the hidden things. Story after story of individuals. In Jeremiah chapter 16, it makes it really clear. This is Jeremiah 16, 17. It says, God says, my eyes are on all their ways. They're not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. It's like, I see that too. Oh my goodness. I mean, uh, uh, the idea that he knows you and that he knows everything about you and that he sees it all, that's both a comfort and it's incredibly frightening. The psalmist said it this way. This is Psalm 139, 1 and 2. Oh, Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. That is true. That is just true. And I think that's what's being communicated. His eyes he sees it all. And if there's any exhortation or application from that, it's like stop living. Stop living as though God doesn't see. Because he does see. And he knows. And the sooner we acknowledge that, the better off our lives will be. And also to live with that thought in mind. Again, this is why John's been given this vision. It's not just of future things. This is the present reality of who Christ is. The fourth thing that we see in these attributes and characteristics is he, it says that he has many diadems, crowns. These are crowns. He doesn't have one, but many. And it's interesting that the number is not given. I think that the number is not given simply to indicate the idea that there is no limit to his sovereignty. And I think we can contrast that with, with other rulers that are mentioned in Revelation where this one has this many crowns and this one has this many crowns. They do have some rule and some authority that's been given to them for a short amount of time, but it's limited. Here, it's unlimited. He has unlimited sovereignty. He's Lord of all. He's King of creation. He's Lord of time and space. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, it says this, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. 
all things. And it lists off some of these. He's the Lord of creation. He's the Lord of heaven. He's the Lord of earth. He's the Lord of the visible. He's the Lord of the invisible. Over all thrones, all dominions, all rulers, all authorities, everything's been created by him and for him. It it kind of sums it up pretty well, doesn't it? He has many crowns. He's Lord. He's king over all of it. This is our Lord. This is our Savior, Jesus. Here's an interesting characteristic. The, The fifth one I want to look at. This is really strange. He has a name written on him that no one knows. What? It's like, what? You kind of just scratch your head. Who can explain this? We know his name. It's Jesus, right? It's, like, it's clear this is Jesus. So we know his name, and yet it says that he's got a name that no one knows. What is that all about? Now, We understand that God has made himself known through the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is God. We must also understand, and I think this is the point, that though he is God, Christ is God, and, and we know him in Jesus, there are hidden depths of God that will never be completely understood. Not this side of eternity anyway, not by mortal men. We sing that song every once in a while. We sing that song, Empty the Ocean. And it's that line of of trying to know the greatness of God is like trying to empty the ocean into the palm of my hand. You can't do it is the point. You, You can't fully understand God. And so again, this, this vision is meant to convey certain things. And it's this that, that we lack complete understanding of God. Even Jesus, we don't know everything about him. Now, I believe that one day, this lack of understanding will be replaced with understanding, at least to a, to a greater degree. In 1 John 3, 2, it says this, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, which is what we're talking about, we're going to be like him, we'll be like him, because we will see him just as he is. There is going to be this glorious day when we'll be revealed for who we are, which we don't really even fully understand who we are. But there's going to be this day when things are going to be changed, we'll be changed, and we're going to see him. And and we'll see ourselves for who we are in him, but we're also going to see him more clearly than we do now. I don't know if we'll ever, you know, be given the capacity to understand everything about God, but we'll certainly understand more. Now, there's another possible thought, and this is kind of an interesting one. In regard to this idea that he has no name or name that's not known by anyone other than himself. Uh, Since I was a child, I've been a fan of those early Clint Eastwood movies. Some of you, probably all of you, are are familiar with the spaghetti westerns. Wah, 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 wah. My dad, when when I was a little boy, my dad would watch those. And I just remember watching those with my dad. And it's just this, the epic characters that were created. Well, these were called spaghetti westerns. And they were, that, that term was coined. There were, there were Western films produced uh, in Europe, specifically by an Italian uh, director. S- some of the films, at least the, the, the trilogy, as it's known, uh, that, that Eastwood starred in, they were also known by his character, the man with no name. Like they, they never told you his name. He was called different things, uh, some derogatory thing. He was called Blondie in, I know, one of the films. He was called other things, but, but no one ever knew his name. And, and the whole idea behind it is, is it, was, it was mystery, right? It created a bit of mystery about this guy. Who is this guy that just kind of shows up? And, of course, uh, they didn't really tell you all about his past, but then in the telling of the story, they would let you know little, little things about his past, little tidbits. 
And pretty much all that you ended up knowing about him was that he was a very dangerous man. Now, as far as storytelling goes, that mystery creates power. Like, mythologically at least, it, it, it adds to the story and, and the, the power that the character has. Leon Morris, a Bible commentator, had this to say. He says, and this has to do with the culture that existed in John's day. He says, those who practiced magic believed that to know the name gave power over him whose name it was. John may well be saying that no one has power over Christ. He is supreme. His name is known only to himself. That's just an interesting thought. That, that within certain cultures, certain pagan cultures, they believe that, hey, if you knew somebody's name, you had a certain power over them. And, and it could be that this is what John's alluding to or that the vision is alluding to. It's like, hey, you, you have no power over Christ. He answers to no one. What it all means, it's hard to know exactly other than to say for sure there are depths to him that we do not understand. The sixth thing that we see here is that he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Earlier in chapter 5, when John sees Jesus in his vision, it says he sees him as a lamb standing as if slain. There's, 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 a, there's something that he sees in that vision that he's, he's been slain. It seems that what's being conveyed here is that even now, in his glorified state, in this image of him returning as the conquering king, his work of salvation is still in view. His sacrifice is even now remembered. Though he is returning as the conquering king, he will forever be the savior. He will forever be our Savior. You know, after he was risen from the dead, after he was raised, after he was glorified, he presented himself to the disciples. And remember, he showed them his scars. His scars remained. And so here he is. He's presented and his clothing has blood on it. Why? It's symbolic of his own sacrifice, the price that he paid to purchase us. It's beautiful. Again, why is this there? What's important about this? Is I want you to remember this about him. I want you to know this about him. This conquering king is your Messiah. He's your savior. The seventh thing that we see here is that he's called the word of God. John emphasizes this repeatedly, both in his gospel and then in his epistle. He, he says this very clearly. That our Lord, that Jesus is the word of God. This is how he's known. In John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, he's writing about Jesus. The whole thing is in that gospel. He's explaining Jesus. He says, Jesus is the word of God. In his epistle, again, the same thing. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, what was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. He's writing about Jesus. He's the word of God. Here he's describing him as the word of life. Here's the idea. We know God by his word, right? This word ha has taught us who God is. God has been revealed to us through Jesus. I remember, maybe you, maybe you could add your own testimony to this, but I remember the day that I put my faith in Jesus Christ and something happened to me. I had been in church. I knew some of the Bible stories, but they were just that. They were stories. 
They were stories that I believed, but I believed them as history. And the day that I put my faith in Jesus Christ, the stories came alive. I, I don't know how to explain it. There is really no way to explain it, but it was like in my brain, in my heart, in my mind, the Word of God came alive. And I began to understand it because I had received Christ, the Word of God. He's the one who has explained God to us. We know God by His Word that's been revealed to us through Jesus. In 1 John one, he goes on to explain, and he uses a, a different word that I think is of interest here in verse 2. Uh, he says, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. I think that word manifested is, is, is really the core of what we're talking about. Jesus Christ has manifested God to us. He's manifested God to the world. He, 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 he has brought, through His Word, He has brought to us the knowledge of God. Thank you. He is the Word of God. And as He arrives here, the eighth thing that we see, as He arrives, He has company. He's not alone. Look at verse 14 again. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following on white horses, following him on white horses. He is not alone. He's flanked by the armies of heaven who are also on white horses. Now, some believe that these are the angels, that this is the army in heaven, these are the angels. But if that's the case, there is no need to describe what they're clothed in. That's not necessary. But this language, fine linen, white and clean, it's symbolic. It's symbolic of somebody whose clothes have been cleaned, have been made white. That's you and I. This is symbolic of our righteousness in Jesus, who has cleansed us, who has, as Isaiah declared, made us white as snow. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. He has made us white. He has made us clean. This was already alluded to in verse 8 from last week. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, it says, When Christ, who was our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. I think that's describing exactly what John sees. When Christ is revealed, that is when he comes, you're going to be revealed with him. In glory. Obviously, with this prophetic narrative, it's speaking of real events. I mean, that, that's the way we read this, right? These are real events that will come to pass in the future. And yet, much of it is illustrated with symbolic or metaphoric imagery. We who have either died or been raptured, we will be coming with Jesus when he returns to reign. We will. Now, uh, will we be riding horses? Again, you have to try to figure this out because some of the language is metaphoric, symbolic. But then there's some of it that we really believe he's really going to come. We really believe that we're going to be with him. I believe that he's going to be on a horse just as John sees. And if that's the case, it sounds like we're going to be riding horses. I don't know. This, I believe it. And this give, gives hope to all the animal lovers. Right? This, this give hope, gives hope to everyone whose pets died because we see that there are animals in heaven. I don't know. Now, I'm not really a cowboy. But the little boy in me imagines that I am. And this sounds like fun. Like, who doesn't like to ride a horse? Horses are cool. I mean, I've been, I, I've been riding motorcycles, you know, most of my life. I don't currently have one, 
but I've had several motorcycles, and that's in essence the same feeling. Right? It's 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 fun and freedom and power. Riding a horse is like that. It's fun. Unless you're afraid of them, I suppose. This won't be like one of those boring trail trots that you pay too much money for. Huh? Who's done that? Like the last time, I remember we did one up at Lake Wenatchee. And I remember we, you know, it was dry and dusty. And, you know, you got these horses that are just tired. And, you know, it's just clomp, clomp, clomp. And it's not really that much fun. And I was at the back of the line, so I was eating everybody's dust the whole time and also thinking about how much I paid for, you know, the <laughs> this isn't going to be like that. This is going to be awesome. I mean, awesome doesn't even describe it adequately. It's going to be incredible. Now, I do think that though the church is envisioned here, the, the saints are in view here, that we are coming with the Lord, I think also will be accompanied by the angels. Like the army that we're talking about, the, the group, it's innumerable. Like it's beyond massive. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, Paul says, Again, we're kind of picking up in the middle of this sentence, but he says, and to give relief to, those, to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Here, he's talking about Jesus coming, Jesus being revealed from heaven, Dealing out retribution, which is exactly what we see here. And it says he's going to be coming with his mighty angels. I think it's going to be all of us all together. And and that just like exponentially makes it sound cool, doesn't it? It's not just all the saints and the angels. Like how cool is this? And it says he's going to be revealed with the angels in flaming fire. He's dealing out retribution. We've already seen, right? What the span of time is this last seven years of time, this tribulation time where he's going to be executing judgment on the world. He's going to uproot Babylon. And yet he still has some judgment to execute, which we're reading about today. We're reading about next week. That leads us to the next thing in the ninth thing. It says from his mouth, comes a a sharp sword. Look at verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. The sharp sword, it's earlier, it's called a a sharp two-edged sword, It's symbolic. Again, I don't think, I don't think when we see Jesus, it's going to be these flames shooting out of his eyeballs and a large sword coming out of his mouth. This is metaphoric language used to describe some attribute, some characteristic of his, that the the Lord wants us to keep in mind. It's that his word is his judgment. Now we're going to look at the execution of his judgment in a minute. But first, I want to finish the the last of these 10 descriptions that we we see. And the last one is, by what authority he acts. It says that he has a name. Now, this is obviously a name that we understand. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He's king of kings and lord of lords. We know this. We've heard this. It's a reality. The mistake that rulers and kings make is that they assume that they are sovereigns of their own realm. And not just kings. You do it. I do it. You have a realm. You have a realm, you have an area of life over which you, at some point, at some time, you kind of have this idea that you're sovereign over it. For me, it's I actually just have a chair. That's all I get. 
No, but you know, you know the feeling. And this isn't entirely evil, but you know the feeling if you're a homeowner or you own stuff, maybe it's even just your car or a collection of cars, or whatever. You have stuff that you, every once in a while, you look and you just go, wow, that's awesome. I, I, you know, I got a fence around my property. This is mine. Now, unless your next thought is, thank you, Lord. Right? You know what it's like to just kind of feel like you're sovereign over your own territory, over these things, and you own them. How many times throughout history has this been illustrated to us in the negative? Where guys think, oh, I'm, I'm Lord, I'm King. One of the most famous examples, of course, comes from the book of Daniel with the King Nebuchadnezzar. The glorious King Nebuchadnezzar, whom God was battling with in order to humble him. And in Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, it tells us that the, it gives us insight into the heart of this guy who was the ruler of the known world. And he took, he took glory to himself. It says, the king reflected. And he said this, is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power for the glory of my majesty. And that's it. That's it in a nutshell. That's what we do. We do it on a little scale. Sometimes we do it on a grander scale. But this is the essence of, of sin. Where we think, well, I, I want to be in charge. I, I want to be in control. God, I, I recognize, Lord, you're Lord, but I got this little area. I, it's my domain. You know, as that story goes, and if you're not familiar with it, it's an incredible story. It says, the next verse says that while the words, while the words were still in his mouth, God declared to him, sovereignty has been taken from you. Like that's the power of God. While, while the words were still in his mouth, God declared, I've taken it all away. You've refused to acknowledge me. And so I'm taking it all from you. Whether we are kings or peasants, we need to acknowledge the lordship of Christ. We need to acknowledge that he's king, that he is Lord. In Romans 14, 11, this is repeated in the New Testament a couple times. It says, it's written, as I say, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me. Every tongue shall give praise to God. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Have you done it yet? Anytime you read these Old Testament quotes, which is in all caps, you know it's an Old Testament quotation. This one comes from Isaiah 45. But I always tell people, you should go back and look, you know, when you see something like that in the New Testament, go read the context of it in the Old Testament. And in Isaiah 45, where this comes from, verses 23 and 24, it says here, God speaking, I have sworn by myself. The word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back. That to me, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. They will say of me, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Men will come to him and all who are angry at him will be put to shame. See, everyone's going to bow. Everyone's going to confess. As believers, we acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, right? We, we say amen. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord in our hearts. He's Lord in our declaration. Yet even today, we can struggle with that. In different areas of our lives where we refuse to surrender to him. And from time to time, the flesh rears its ugly head and seems to thwart God's will in our lives. We should, I want to, we should all want to live with these verses, this reality in our mind every day. Jesus is Lord. And, th and that's really, like that's really the process of being a disciple. Where every day we get up and we say, okay, your Lord, I'm not. 
right? I'm not the sovereign. You're the sovereign. You're the Lord of Lords. You're the King of Kings. And this ought to be our daily prayer. Lord, be Lord. Not just in my confession, but in my daily living. Well, this ends with the great war that wasn't. It's the great war that wasn't. At the time of Jesus' return, verse 19 tells us that all the armies of the world will be assembled to make war against him. The beast, the false prophet, they're all assembled to battle Christ. It would seem that the current delusion that is sweeping the world is not going to go away. You know what I'm talking about? The world's gone crazy. I mean, every day we read stuff and just like, what? It's not so out there. This war is sin's inevitability. It's the conclusion of man's war with God. I remember years ago teaching in the book of Romans and mentioning that we are at war with God and that we were at one point, we were his enemies. And afterwards, I'll never forget this. After I got done, right away, a a woman came up to me and I could tell she was just ready to give me a lesson. And she scolded me. And she said, you said, you said I was God's enemy. I was never God's enemy. We don't like to think of ourselves in that way, but that's the nature of sin. That's the sin within us. And the sin that's within us is rebellion. It's always been rebellion. And the sin that remains in us, it's still rebellion against God. Though conquered in Christ, amen, I'm so thankful for that, yet it's still rebellion. In Romans chapter 5, which I'm sure was the text I was teaching at the time, though I don't recall, it says in verse 10, while we were enemies, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. This is just talking about the state of us apart from Christ. We were enemies. You and I, we were enemies, all of us. And we've only been reconciled to God because of what Jesus has done. Thank you for that. In Colossians 1.21, it says, And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. Again, same thing. At war with God. Now for us, for us, the battle has been won, right? Thank God the battle has been won. The war has already happened. The battle's been won. Not that we won, but through faith in Christ we've won. He has won on our behalf. He won us by his love. He conquered sin. He conquered your sin. He conquered my sin. He's Lord of Lords. He's King of Kings. And he will either be so in this life and for eternity as we humble ourselves, repent of our sins and believe in him. Or he will be king in eternal judgment for those who refuse to acknowledge him in this life. Again, I told you, this is glory. This is glory for us, but it's also tragedy. It's horrific. The culmination of the insanity of unbelief is pictured here. Under the leadership of the Antichrist, all of the kings, all of the armies, they'll be represented, they'll be assembled to make war against the returning king. It's crazy to even think about. And here's the thing. There's no battle. They're assembled, but there's no battle. It's the war that wasn't. Look at verse 20. And the beast was seized. And with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. You know, there's so many people out there, liberal theologians, that say, oh, you know, there's not such a thing as hell. Really? 
what do you do with this? What do you do with all of Jesus' references to it? Outer darkness, separation from God. There is eternal punishment. And I love this, this picture again. And it, it, it not only are these guys picked up and thrown into the lake of fire, it says, verse 21 says, and the rest were killed. All the armies, they're destroyed. Not a shot is fired. And I, I, I don't know how this is all going to go down. I just, I, I have always had this vision, maybe you too, of just, he's just going to poop. There you go. There you go, beast. There you go, false prophet. You've deceived the entire world. You're gone. And all your armies, and this, again, this seems horrific. This seems tragic. But these are people who've had chance after chance after chance, especially during this last seven-year period of time where God is making himself really clear that he's against sin, that he's against the rebellion of mankind, and they've refused at every turn to repent. And so they're in this final state of complete unrepentance, even to the point where they'll, we are going we are to kill Jesus when he returns. Like, it's, it's so crazy. Again, it's the inevitability of sin. This is where sin always leads, because it's war with God. How will Jesus accomplish all of this? You know, how is he going to destroy the, 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 the Antichrist and the false prophet and then everyone else who's assembled to make war against him? I think it goes back to verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword. And with it, he's going to strike down the nations. It's just going to be a word. Like even that picture that I just painted of him, I, I, don't, I don't think he's going to physically even be involved. He's just going to speak it because that's the power of his word. It's the power of his word that created the world with a word. He spoke it into existence. And with his word, he will also judge it. He's already judged it. This battle is over again without a shot fired, and it's a slaughter. And what ensues is described as the great supper of God. Again, it's, it's not pretty. It's a horrific picture. The angel in verse 17 beckons, calls out to all the birds, saying, come assemble for the great supper of God. Now this is, this is obviously in sharp contrast to what we read earlier of the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is a celebration for the believers. It's going to go on forever. It's eternity. It's us being with Jesus forever. It's awesome. And this is in sharp contrast with it. it, it it's obliteration of unbelieving mankind in which literally these armies, it seems from the language, these armies are literally going to be killed and, and their bodies fed to the birds. Again, why this language? Why is it so stark? Because God wants us to remember this. He wants us to understand this. It's the end of the matter. It's going to be glorious for the believer. It's going to be absolutely glorious for the believer and absolutely tragic for those who've rejected Christ in this life. If you find yourself today at war with God, you need to end it because this is the end of it, right? This is what it's going to be like. If you leave this earth, you leave your body in a condition of rebellion against God, you will forever be separated from him in hell. And, 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 and all the while, you could just end the war. You could just surrender today, which, which I'm looking at you guys. We've done that, amen? We've surrendered to Christ. Lord, forgive me. If you've never done that, do it today. Do not. I mean, you don't know. The Bible says that tomorrow is not promised. You don't know the day that the Lord's coming. You don't know the day that you're going to die. And, the, and, and though, you know, I don't think this is intended to, to manipulate us. It's just the reality of what's coming. Again, you should know the end of the matter. And the end of the matter is those who die apart from Christ will get exactly what they want. They'll be apart from Christ forever. 
Repent of your sins. Ask him to forgive you. And then also I think these things ought to inform us in the sense of glory to what we have to look forward to, but also to understand the horror that people are going to experience who've rejected him. And it ought to be a motivator for us to share the gospel. We're living at a time in a world that is confused and needs to hear about Jesus. And that's our job. That's the church's job. Father, thank you for your word. God, I pray that we would just absorb these things, that we would hold on to them. I thank you for the revelation, the uncovering, the the revealing of it all. These are the things that are coming upon the world. For us, it's glory. God, thank you. We could, never, we, we could never mine the depths of all of this. It's so wonderful. It's so awesome. And we're looking forward to seeing you. We're looking forward to being with you. We're looking forward to spending eternity with you. At the same time, Lord, I pray that you keep us mindful of the horror that's going to befall those who have rejected you and that we would be motivated to be ambassadors, to be motivated to tell people about Jesus and their need for him. I pray that you would open doors of opportunity for us, even this week, that that we could tell somebody about the God who knows them and loves them and who gave his life for them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we're...